Good morning. Before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that EBC Okanagan is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Seals Okanagan Nation. I would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places, some near and some far, and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Good morning and welcome. Everyone. It's my pleasure today to introduce the first webinar, the Institute of Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention for the 24-25 season. It is what does learning look like at an age-friendly university, a panel discussion. I am Dr. Jen Jacoby, the Director of the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention and the NSER Chair for Women in Science and Engineering. If you'd like more information on the Institute's webinars this year, please check out our website. Um, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Before we get underway with our speakers, I'd like to just remind people of some uh, Zoom uh, etiquette as well as some tips for today. First off, the closed captioning. The closed captioning box can be moved to your preferred place by clicking and dragging it to wherever you would like on your screen. Now, if you prefer to turn the closed captioning off, select the hide caption button on the menu bar. For questions today, please type your questions or comments for the speaker into the chat box during the presentations. And then questions will be read and addressed at the end of the presentation um, for the particular speaker that you're looking to address or across the panel of speakers. Now, before I introduce today's speakers, I would like to give you just a brief overview of what an age-friendly university is. So an age-friendly university, and there's institutions around the world that are becoming members of the age-friendly university network, have committed themselves to basically becoming more age-friendly in their programs and policies. Um, this can be in ways that higher education can shape teaching and learning environments, and most importantly, disrupt ageist beliefs and bias in constructive ways and really promote intergenerational learning and solidarity. Now, as in institutions become members of the Age-Friendly University Network, we make a commitment to 10 principles. Now, those 10 principles written here on the screen do not need to be memorized or learned. They can be summarized by basically creating an environment where people of all ages can interact in both a learned as well as social opportunity to basically increase health and well-being, to support the arts and cultural activities, and really to bring intergenerational activities and support to each other together. And that's what we're gonna to speak to today. So who are the speakers for today? And I'm gonna invite uh, John to share his slides as soon as I stop sharing. There you go, John. Or Dale, sorry, my mistake, Dale. Pardon me. Now I'm gonna start by introducing our three speakers as Dale shares his slides. Dale is the Vice President of Students at UBC Okanagan and he will be our first presenter, followed by Dr. John Corbett. Dr. John Corbett is a professor as well as a um, lead for cultural um, and community engaged research here at UBC Okanagan. And then Gary McCracken will follow up. And Gary is a retiree and a former master's student at UBC Okanagan as an older adult. So without further ado, uh, Dale. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dale Mullings. I use the pronouns he, him. Uh, and I am the Associate Vice President of Students here at UBC Okanagan. Um, in my role, I have the opportunity to support eight departments that support students both inside and outside of the classroom. Um, so that includes some of our departments like well-being and accessibility services, athletics and recreation, academic and uh, career development, uh, our global engagement office, and more. What uh, I want to spend our time uh, with uh, talking about today because uh, trying to spend about 10 to 12 minutes is I'll do a deeper dive on one of our departments and how we're moving forward the age-friendly um, university um, agenda here and that being uh, our Indigenous Programs and Services uh, Department. Before I do that I wanted to share our vision uh, within the AVPS and that's you know what brings all of these various departments that are working to support students outside of the classroom uh, together and this vision uh, at the top here 
uh, is really our 10 year horizon. I think it really uh, also highlights um, our alignment with an age friendly university being that we want to be a, a community connected portfolio, uh, building a campus culture of well being, truth and reconciliation and equitable access. So all students can have the opportunity to experience everything that UBC has to offer. Um, in the three examples I'll share today, uh, I think you'll be able to see how we're moving forward, both ex uh, ex uh, equitable access, but also truth, truth and reconciliation uh, commitments. Uh, there are a number of priorities across the university, and we've really tried to distill down to these three pillars in the work that we're doing over the next uh, 10 years to support our students. First up, uh, this is a, a longstanding program, uh, the uh, Aboriginal Access uh, Studies Program that we do within Indigenous programs and services with all of our faculties across campus. Um, many of you may be aware that UBC Okanagan's campus uh, has the uh, unique distinction of being founded in partnership with local uh, Indigenous peoples, the Silks Okanagan Nation. So since 2005, UBC and the Okanagan Nation Alliance have been really working in partnership to enhance uh, education and support um, Okanagan Indigenous culture, history, language, um, philosophy, and knowledge. In With this program, uh, which was introduced in 2007, just two years, kind of after UBCO came uh, into inception, um, we've had um, 497 uh, students transition uh, into full-time uh, academic study, uh, regardless of their academic background, if they had completed uh, high school or not. And um, uh, the average age uh, has been 24 years of age, but our, the range of age is what's really important here. And uh, we have students that join us that are 17 years old, but we also have students that are 77 years old. Um, so our average age of joining um, through this program is older than our uh, traditional age uh, population, but um, it's really a success story uh, to have now over 500 students because we have a new cohort that have joined this year. Um, entering into, in their first year, uh, three uh, in the first term, uh, three university level courses, um, in their intended degree program. And then we wrap around supports in terms of offering a peer mentor. There's direct tutoring and a transition program that's built, that's offered uh, each week uh, for the entire first year. As students complete six credits in their first year, uh, if they're successful in completing 60, uh, per, uh, achieving a 60% average and completing those courses, they're able to transition automatically into their, uh, to, into their degree program. We also have Indigenous student advisors that provide individualized supports uh, to these uh, students uh, to help them choose the appropriate courses based on their uh, their history and background, um, and then set them up for success by establishing degree goals and regular check-ins uh, throughout that time. So really a uh, longstanding um, program with uh, a lot of success and uh, something that's uh, looked at as a model for other institutions across Canada. Next up would be something that's more recent. Uh, within the last four years, uh, our campus in its commitment to truth and reconciliation has introduced uh, three new language uh, programs um, with uh, the first of which being the Insulction Language Program that started uh, three years ago. Um, this partnership really with our indigenous communities also wouldn't take place without incredible collaboration with the Nicola Institute of Technology where our students have the opportunity to complete two years of a diploma program and then transition all of those credits into the third year of study here at UBC Okanagan. Really those first two years are then um, offered and delivered in community. Um, and so um, it really does allow for a, a more seamless transition to the, to the university here. And much like our access program, we offer an orientation here, but we take all of that orientation that's delivered in the access program um, over the entire first year, and we consolidate it into a course um, that's uh, a one week intensive course in August to help uh, transition uh, students uh, to our uh, language programs. The, uh, we have 50 students uh, that have transitioned into uh, these courses or into the programs now uh, into year three. And um, with uh, the age range really being um, 22 to 70, um, but we also have uh, that average age being 44 years of age. Uh, six of our students are over the age of 65. Um, one of the incredible opportunities here is just really the collaboration with uh, our Indigenous community and uh, local uh, elders that uh, offer quite a bit of our programming. 
But our um, Indigenous Language Fluency Advisor specifically works uh, to offer this direct programming to support the students um, outside of the classroom with um, uh, our tutoring program. Um, and also removing barriers to the application process, the transition through and the transition out. So one of the examples uh, here would be um, the advisor working very closely with our admissions team uh, to be out in community, working on the applications, taking handwritten applications and converting them to uh, a virtual uh, platform that we use for the university but also um, advocating and removing some of the information that may not be necessary, recognizing these students have completed a diploma now with uh, Nicola, Nicola Valley. We've been able to uh, remove the high school uh, requirement off the application for those students that um, uh, may have been survivors of residential schools, for example. So uh, it's done a lot to uh, um, address some of the barriers uh, that folks may see in terms of uh, accessing uh, post-secondary. Last up, I just wanted to share, um, as we look to uh, further our commitments on truth and reconciliation, we've also wanted to uh, strengthen the number of Indigenous students that transition into graduate studies. Uh, in partnership uh, with uh, grad studies on, on our campus, we've introduced the Indigenous Graduate Student Pathways Program. Um, in, this, uh, in this program, we have both undergraduate students uh, that are uh, nearing the uh, end of their undergraduate degrees, but we also have alumni uh, individuals that are in our community that are looking to transition back to university uh, to complete a, a graduate degree. There's mentorship from our faculty um, in all of our uh, program areas, and we offer a number of workshops led by UBCO faculty and staff uh, and a number of cultural opportunities um, to help uh, folks with the transition into, into graduate studies. Uh, this is a new program. Uh, we've only had one cohort move through, and we had 21 uh, Indigenous uh, identifying students uh, participate in the first uh, first year, 18 of which transitioned into, into graduate programs. Um, not necessarily at UBCO, they have the opportunity to uh, move into graduate programs across the country and across the world, uh, but it really does offer a lot of support uh, in seeing that pathway into, into graduate programs. Um, so, um, honestly, this program really wouldn't be able to be be possible without a uh, great partnership, both with uh, in community, but also with our faculties and uh, quite a bit of success. We have 18 students that have signed up this year, um, both uh, students and alumni uh, in our community uh, for our second cohort uh, of this program. So with that, uh, I'll wrap up. Um, uh, there's opportunities for me to share maybe what we're doing with athletics and recreation, with in the introduction of uh, pickleball or some of our partnerships with uh, with the city. Um, but you can also reach out to me uh, if you'd like uh, after the webinar at dale.mullings at ubc.ca. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll pass it over to Joan. Right, I suppose I'm just going to jump right on in here. I'm going to just try and share my screen. Hopefully it'll be big enough for you to be able to view. Let me find uh, my presentation. And here we go. I'm going to ask for a quick thumbs up. Does that look okay? Dale, I'm going to ask you because I can see you. Sweet, man. Thank you. Dale, thank you so much for that. You know, I, I really appreciate the work that you're doing around, um, you know, enabling Indigenous students come through the system. It's hugely important. I'm, I don't know if you know, I'm the head of the Department of Community, Culture and Global Studies, which the Indigenous Language Fluency Programs are part of, as well as Indigenous Studies. And so, you know, we really appreciate the work that you and Ryan and all these other people are doing. It's it's huge. So thank you. Um, okay, so it's kind of like not dissimilar from the stuff that uh, Dale was just talking about, but I really want to talk about research. Um, Dale's done a really nice piece around students and sort of the exception or the the acceptance of non-traditional students into the university. Um, and I want to talk specifically about when you come into the university, there's a whole bunch of different things you can do. Of course, first of all, you can engage in learning through things like undergraduate or graduate courses. But I'm really interested in the research function. So what do we do as researchers within the community and how do we support community and how do we embrace community members of all different ages to come and feel like they have a place here at the university. And specifically, my research is sort of embedded within this frame of what we call community engaged research. I just want to talk a little bit about community engaged research. I want to talk about some of the opportunities, some of the challenges, and then talk about some of the sort of ways that you can get involved um, here at UBC. 
So first of all, community engaged research, a, a quote from the Equity Research, uh, research and Innovation Center at Yale University. Community engaged research is a process that incorporates input from people who the research outcomes will impact and involves such people or groups as equal partners throughout the research process. So in other words, it's about the university rethinking its role and not just examining the number of angels on top of the pinhead, but to start to think about, well, how do we actually engage with questions which are really important to community? But it would be so arrogant for us to think we know what all these questions actually are. So when we think about community engaged research, it's actually much more about how do we co-design research? So in fact, it solves problems which are actually relevant to community and, and actually will engage and, and embrace and bring people in so that they actually feel an intrinsic part of the research process. And I think that there's a whole series of different opportunities related to this. Opportunities for community, opportunities for us as researchers, for our graduate students and for our undergraduate students. <clears throat> I want to really talk us quickly talk us through just a few um, a few of these potential opportunities. First of all, it allows us the opportunity to be able to foster this sort of two-way exchange of knowledge. Um, it, and in doing so, it will enrich both us as well as the community and how we understand the places in which we live. Um, I, I don't want to go off completely on the side, but this idea about place-based research is absolutely vital to the sort of foundations of community-engaged research. And I think that that's because community-engaged research allows us to become more relevant. It allows us to be able to undertake research, which is relevant to the communities that we live in. Um, and that's of relevance to those communities, because hopefully that will help to solve or at least move towards solving issues, problems, uh, concerns within community. But also, really importantly, it creates relevance for the university, because as the university transforms, I mean, the universities and the newspapers so much now around things like, you know, international students, it allows us to be able to create more relevance for ourselves. And in doing that as well, of course, we build capacity. We build capacity um, not just within the community members who we work with, but also we build capacity within the students uh, and as well the faculty members that are engaged in this type of research. It builds trust. Or we build relationships. And I think Dale's example right now about talking about, you know, our, our, our willingness to now, um, you know, embrace Indigenous students of all ages um, is a super example of that. Building trust with our local Aboriginal communities. But it's not just about building trust in those sectors. It's about building trust with all the different organisations, um, governments, um, uh, individuals, um, special interest groups that are actually based in community as well. And also it provides all sorts of access to different uh, new funding opportunities as well. But I'd be naive to think that, you know, it's all just sort of sunshine and light as well, because there's a number of challenges involved with, um, you know, implementing effective community engaged research, um, issues that we might come across, power dynamics, um, you know, there is a fundamental difference between, you know, people with PhDs that work in an institution like UBC and maybe a small organization or a small First Nation community who we might actually be working with. Um, and so I think we need to be constantly aware around equitable participation and how decisions are made within the sort of, you know, the research um, processes. Uh, also, you know, community engaged research is resource intensive. It requires a lot of time. It requires a lot of investment from community members, as well as from, 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 um, from university people as well. And sometimes, you know, things don't necessarily align, you know, around, you know, the times that you're available to do research uh, uh, and, uh, and how much we can actually invest into this. And from a researcher's perspective as well, this is super complicated because we're bound often by the sort of barriers which the institution actually puts on us. For example, if you're a faculty member, you have to be able to publish in peer reviewed articles, you need to be able to, you know, prove that you're effective and actually uh, getting research grant writing uh, sort of research grant money. And, and then you put that into the context of, oh, my gosh, it takes so much time to do community engaged research. Sometimes I feel like we're a little bit at odds, you know, between what we would like to achieve as an institution and what we can effectively achieve. And the sort of these sort of, you know, these um, very much these institutional barriers which are so fundamental to universities because they've been in place you know for decades and they're not changing uh, that fast and of course the third the fourth thing is is ethical considerations and, you know we need to ensure that every time that we engaged in community engaged research that there's this fundamental sort of ethical set of values which guides the research and we're not just simply involved with these things as a form of expediency 
So I pose this question as well, like why is community engaged research actually important? But then to understand that when we think about that, in fact, there's so many different perspectives. You know, there are the differing perspectives of the university, of the individual researchers involved, the graduate students and undergraduate students involved in actually doing research, the community members, our local organizations who we might be working in partnership with, our government who we might be working in partnership. And I think everybody comes to this relationship uh, with a different set of priorities and a different set of, of, of perspectives. I want to talk really quickly about uh, the Institute for Community Engaged Research. Um, I was the um, in the director of this institute for the last eight years. I subsequently stepped down in in um, in, in July to take on a new role. But I wanted to really quickly talk about how we at UBC Okanagan are actually developing all sorts of different community engaged research opportunities. So thinking a little bit, um, you know, community engaged research has had a lot of support from the institution over the last ten years or so. Uh, we had a, a, a vice president of research that was really supportive around the development of different institutes, which were push forward certain research agendas. Now, Jen is, is the director of one institute uh, for uh, chronic disease and healthy living. I was the, um, the director of ISA, so the Institute for Community Engaged Research. So it's an interesting thing to really sort of embrace and support um, pushing forward a research agenda. So ISA, or the Institute, had five key areas it was working in. One was pedagogy and participation, another communication, community and representation, another one on social inclusion and equity, one on social, spatial and economic justice, and one on decolonization and indigeneity. So these are sort of the broad areas that we were interested in working with. And it involves a whole bunch of different faculty members. I think we right now have 45 different faculty members. Uh, who are actually members of the institute, as well as like I last count was over 85 graduate students and a number of staff members as well. And we work with over 30 organizations in the community, whether it's the Okanagan Nations Alliance, the Analkin Center, Pathways, uh, CMHA, a whole bunch of different folk. So you can see that there's already this sort of quite sort of strong motivation around developing these relationships between what's going on in the university and these key organizations within our community. So ISA offers a space to bring people together um, uh, um, and it's used extensively, not just by students and faculty members, but by members of the community as well. We put on a whole bunch of different sort of events, whether it's our starting a conversation a series, which understood that, you know, we get a bunch of really amazing, um, you know, speakers that come in from the outside giving these sort of notable keynote uh, lectures. But there's rarely an opportunity to actually sit down and particularly for students and members of the community to sit down and be able to actually engage in a conversation. So starting a conversation was about bringing in these notable speakers, letting them talk for five, 10 minutes and then just opening it up for a dialogue. So this is one of the uh, speaker series that we're involved with. Uh, but we do a whole bunch of other stuff in community, whether it's putting on our Okanagan Research Forum, our Storyteller Series, our thing we called Relaxa Kucha, which was built on the Petakucha model, but really ways where we bring the university into the community around issues related to research. And we also worked on a series of different actual projects within communities as well. Uh, we helped to spearhead the uh, City of Kelowna reconciliation process, where we trained close to 100 city staff members around reconciliation, how to implement the, the, the TRC's um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, calls to action. We've worked on issues related to homelessness, um, uh, issues related to intellectual disability with Rochelle Hall and her group in, the, in, the, um, in, in another institute um, at UBC. So I think there's all sorts of opportunities that ISA um, represents. And I would really encourage people, particularly if you are community members, to explore how you could become involved. Um, it's a very age-friendly uh, space. Um, ISA acts as a medium or a conduit to be able to put you in touch with other researchers here on campus, a place for you to come when you're on campus. If you want to put on events or you want to be involved in events, I would really encourage you, um, you know, to explore it a, a little bit longer or a little bit further. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, and that's it from me. I'm going to pass over now to you, Gary. Thanks very much, John. Am I up? Any, um, my name is Gary McCracken, and as uh, Jen uh, mentioned earlier, I'm a uh, recent graduate of uh, UBCO. I graduated with a, a Master's of Science in Health and Exercise Science in 2021. Now, I like the description that they have for me in the, uh, the write-up for this program, and that is uh, that I'm a lifelong learner. 
what wasn't mentioned was that it's taken me almost a lifetime to earn that description. So let me start with a bit of a background about me. My undergraduate degree is in uh, civil engineering from the Royal Military College of uh, Canada in Kingston, Ontario. And ironically, right now I'm sitting in a hotel room in uh, Toronto on my way home after my 50th uh, uh, anniversary graduation reunion, quite the party. At RMC, I considered academics to be, quite frankly, a necessary evil. Uh, sports were always my go-to preference. The following uh, graduation, I took my uh, commission as a lieutenant in the Canadian Army and uh, continued on from there. But there came a time when I realized I was going to have to make amends for my uh, poor academic performance. So while, uh, while I was stationed in Toronto, I began a, uh, a part-time MBA program at uh, York University. Unfortunately, I was transferred before I could complete those studies. I later enrolled in a uh, postgrad program in urban and regional planning at uh, Queen's University. And this was uh, sponsored by the military. There I developed an appreciation for academic work. And although I wouldn't say my performance was stellar, I did work hard. And as a result, I was, I was rewarded with a five-year post into Germany where I was responsible for infrastructure planning for the Canadian forces in Europe. After retiring from the military, I took, up, I took on several positions in engineering and technical sales. But at the age of 60, I, I was looking for a new challenge, new challenges to, uh, to, uh, to make, my, make life better for, for my future. And I was softly, co softly coerced into becoming a personal trainer, working with older adults. And in this capacity, I was asked to uh, talk with groups about healthy aging. Now, after one of these presentations, a fellow walked up to me and commented, you're an engineer. What do you really know about this? Well, that was a fair, fair question. And uh, it helped me uh, see a, a need to round out my education as it related to my new profession. So I started the application at UBCO for a research-based post-grad program in health and exercise science. Now, issues came, came up right from the start. After all, I was an old guy breaking new ground and the system wasn't really ready for me at the time. First, I needed uh, academic references and examples of research papers. Well, needless, needless to say, 45 years after graduation, my old profs were either dead or they were alive, but they wouldn't remember me because of my lackluster academic performance. And so after some discussion, References from professional contra uh, contacts were uh, accepted. Now, as for research papers, nope. My other postgrad work and my uh, engineering studies were all classroom and project oriented with virtually no research. Now, that was something that was going to come back and haunt me later. I was eventually uh, accepted into a two year program. Now, that created another issue. As an older adult, I wasn't looking to rush through this and go find a job or find a position as a uh, PhD candidate. After all, I was sort of retired. I wanted a part. I wanted part time. I needed a program that would allow me to get time for my personal training practice, for my work with charities, and for, and to, let's face it, to travel. Um, unfortunately, this program was only offered as a full time basis. Again, after much discussion and. You know, after much discussion, as a solution was found, I could enroll in full-time uh, program, and the university would grant ex extensions as required. Now, Jen, who was my uh, my uh, my supervisor, kept saying that I needed to cut back on my extracurricular activities. I reminded her that this was my extracurricular activity. My point in all of this was that the university, especially the College of Graduate Studies bent over backwards to support me and to find ways to accommodate me. In writing my thesis, there was one section that Jen did not get a chance to review until it was ready for, uh, for publication. And that was the acknowledgements. Now, if I can um, quote directly from that, uh, a brief section, everyone that I have encountered has been friendly, helpful, professional, and above all else, supportive. 
One person in, in particular comes to mind, Sarah McDonald. Um, yeah, Sarah McDonald in the College of uh, Graduate Studies. She was always willing to offer assistance, explain several times if necessary, the intricacies of various rules and find workarounds as, uh, as appropriate. So when this uh, section was uh, finished, I sent it, uh, sent it off to uh, Jen and within minutes, I got a phone call. Unfortunately, I did not know that uh, when I wrote this, that Sarah was ill. She passed away shortly afterwards, but not before I got a chance to read it to her. Now, so far, everything sounds sort of rosy. Well, it wasn't. I was warned that this was going to be a lot of hard work. Come on. After RMC with 40 hours of classes a week, as well as military duties and studies and sports, lots of sports, how hard could this be? Well, turns out really hard. Research, especially in this age of uh, computer access to every library in the world, is a daunting challenge. The learning curve was steep and very long. There were times when I'd ask myself, what the heck, actually stronger than that, what the heck are you doing here? And self-doubt is a yeah, normal aspect of postgraduate studies. Am I good enough? Should I even be here? Well, que questions like this may be normal, but I brought them to a new, a new level. And it wasn't just me questioning me. While I was very impressed and thankful for the support of most of the students, others voiced opinions about my credibility, and rightfully so. Almost all of them had been introduced to research while in their undergrad studies. The criticisms of me were justified initially, but I learned. And the extra couple of years helped a lot. I've been a student at several universities, but dealing with the faculty and staff at UBCO was a very positive experience. It may be that they didn't look at me as a regular student. After all, I wasn't. I had more life experience than just about any of them, and that garnered a degree of respect. It also meant that I was able to, <clears throat> excuse me, I was able to offer uh, a different point of view in many of the discussions and was able to help some students with some real life uh, advice. Now, from the beginning, I was looking not only for an academic adventure, but also an opportunity to engage with the younger people at their level, my classmates. While there were some rocky, st rocky starts, I began to uh, fit in. Then the pandemic hit, and like everything else, the university shut down and Zoom became a regular part of my communication with faculty and other students. Not quite the experience I was hoping for. Research for my thesis was conducted almost exclusively from my home office. Even the defense of my thesis was conducted on uh, Zoom. And look at us now, we still look, we're still relying on Zoom. Now, one of the really great benefits of studies at UBCO that I don't think gets near enough attention is that the university attracts students from all over the world. I've been lucky and I have lived and traveled abroad for much of my life. But if you haven't, this is a great opportunity to learn about different cultures. It's a great opportunity to make some very interesting friends. Many of my international friends have decided to remain in Canada. And a couple of them have even invited me to their citizenship ceremonies. Some have returned uh, to their home countries and I've had the chance to visit with them and their families. So. If you're thinking about going to and going back to school, for whatever reason that may be, and whether it's a degree program or just the odd course to keep your mind occupied, some recommendations to consider. First of all, do it. You'll not regret it. Yes, it will consume a lot of time and, and it will be a challenge, but that challenge will help keep your mind sharp. If you enroll in a yeah, degree program, get to know your grandchildren very well. They were born with computers. They, they will be able to help you find out how to complete the admission process, how to enroll in courses, and uh, even how to go to search for papers online. Gone are the days of slide rules and paper notepads. 
I even went into the School of Engineering and queried a, a number of uh, of uh, engineering students what if they knew what a slide rule was. Nobody did. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Your your professors, your fellow students, and library staff are important resources. If you enroll in a research program, get to know the staff at the library. They've saved my butt many times. Be open to possibilities. There's a lot to learn, but there's also a lot that you can offer. Education is a great way to keep your mind sharp, but don't forget your body. Exercise will help keep your mind focused on your studies. It also helps to ensure that you're able to chase all of those other items on your bucket list. Thank you. Jaqueta or, or Jen, over to you. It's Gary and John and Dale. Um, it's been wonderful to sit back and just listen to you all share what I think is amazing experiences of non-traditional learning, non-traditional engagement, um, and how the university really is evolving and advancing to embrace um, all learners. And as, as Gary rightfully shared here, um, it, the learning goes on both sides. So it's not just the academic institution or the professors in front of the classroom that are sharing what they know um, and dispensing or dispelling myths and dispensing information rather. It, it really is a two-way street and that's something that I definitely learned along the way um, over the last few decades and especially through Gary as did other students in my lab. Um, so if you have questions, um, please place them in the chat. Um, we've got a few that we um, received prior to this event. Um, so we'll kind of talk around those as well as any other ones that might appear. Um, before we uh, get going with the Q&A, if there are any questions that come up. Dale, I'm wondering if you can um, address some of the unique opportunities that might be here, or maybe they're not just unique to here, but um, at various other institutions as we are, look at the diversity of learners and how we can create um, spaces for all people. What are the different um, opportunities here at UBCO or other places? Yeah, maybe I'll talk about um, something that's available everywhere, only because if you don't look to go to UBCO, but you're looking to uh, study again somewhere. Um, I think it would be uh, a misnomer to think that uh, as a as an adult learner, you shouldn't get involved with clubs, that it's only for undergraduate students. Uh, I'll suggest that um, one of the number one barriers, are, it's uh, really in the top two here in terms of why uh, people do leave post-secondary is when they don't create a sense of belonging. So finding that opportunity to make a connection on the campus um, is really critically important. Um, for most, you know, academic program and getting that right fit uh, would be the number one reason, but really not having that connection with others is so critical. Um, so spending time on campus to make relationships, to find people that are um, transitioning um, in a similar experience is really critical to success. It doesn't mean you have to get involved with, say, the ice cream club, where maybe more uh, more uh, undergraduate students may be getting involved, but it's ice creams for everyone. Um, but there are uh, faculty course unions, uh, which uh, align with each academic uh, program that bring together people that are uh, like-minded and thinking about their academic program that bring together the opportunity to engage with faculty, say, outside of the classroom, uh, getting them together to, to really understand what the research is, go bowling, um, and build relationships that uh, can make connections to uh, talking about, well, how do I get involved with, uh, with a research project? Or what might I be doing to become a, a teaching assistant on campus? Um, and then there's other types of really focused clubs and activities um, like our debate club or uh, concrete toboggan club that bring people together and, and bringing in um, that shared interest uh, to make connections. And so regardless of where you choose to study, the importance of spending time on campus, um, uh, either through clubs or in physical spaces. Uh, for example, here at the Okanagan campus, um, we have collegias, which are uh, for our commuter students 
that come together. It's a space to be able to study and build community uh, all across our campus and they're theme based based on global interest or uh, for graduate students to come together and really spending time there um, is really just uh, really important, especially uh, during your first year uh, of returning to study. Thanks, Jim. There is a specific question um, that fits within your portfolio, um, a little bit different than the extracurricular. It goes back to the curricular. Uh, can seniors audit classes? And if yes, what is the process? I may uh, I may call on John to to offer a perspective uh, because it does vary from faculty member to to faculty member. Um, uh, it is possible to audit some courses. Um, and this is where speaking to an advisor, either an academic and career advisor or an Indigenous advisor is really critical. There's um, some unwritten rules uh, within the university that people may not know when you're returning to, to study. And that this example is one, uh, particularly in the first couple of weeks of class, uh, having that opportunity to, to audit a class that maybe you're not in, but you're not sure that if it's the right fit, Having that conversation with the instructor uh, at the beginning to express your interest in the course and wanting to see if it's the right fit for you, uh, and also ask if there's a wait list for the course is something that is uh, possible. Uh, not every faculty member can can offer that. You know there are um, regulations around uh, the size of a classroom for uh, fire safety, uh, as an example. But um, most instructors are are quite willing to to engage in that conversation if you introduce it. But uh, John, Jennifer, would either of you like to to comment also from your experience? Yeah, no doubt. I think you I think you you've covered it off nicely. I mean, I think as well, you know, a lot of particularly now sort of you know entry level courses, so first, second year, tend to be online as well. So obviously, the cap is less of an of an issue, um, and the willingness, I think, for you know for the instructor to allow you into those sorts of courses would be good. Um, I want to talk just very briefly about some of the um, Indigenous courses that we're offering because these are extremely popular right now. Um, we have a number of first year classes which are sort of introductions to things like indigeneity, where we have they're all taught online and we have 450 students in those classes so they're they're really vast um, and that would be a good opportunity to sort of engage in online teaching. We do teach some of these 100 level classes in person, but they're restricted just to Indigenous students. So we don't allow non-Indigenous students to actually um, to take those classes. But Dale's absolutely right. I mean, the easiest way forward, have a chat with an advisor. You could always trawl your way through, um, you know, through the, the university calendar, which has all of the different courses which are being offered and just see what interests you. And I think generally speaking, most instructors are always happy to have people in their class, particularly informed, engaged, um, you know, older, older members of the class, because I feel that they often will sort of bring a, a maturity, which then encourages all the students to be, you know, to engage more maturely with, with the content as well. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with both what John and Dale said. Um, speaking as a faculty member, um, I would encourage you to just as a potential uh, student who wants to audit, to go speak with the faculty member. Most courses will have the faculty member's name listed next to the course. Um, and then in the directory, you can either find their email address, their telephone number, or their office location. And um, surprisingly, actually, most faculty really enjoy visits from people to their office. Um, so there's nothing wrong with dropping by. If they're busy, they won't be afraid to say they're busy and invite you back another time, most often, but have a conversation with them about their course um, and consider, is it right for you, both as a learner and a listener, um, and also consider something atypical. There are courses uh, here at UBCO that teach about aging. Well, you live it. So also there is opportunity for older adults to be part of a class and share their lived experiences in one particular class room session or across the entire um, course. So that's another way that individuals can participate if you don't wanna take a formal course. I think what I'm gonna do is punt it over to Gary because Gary does have some experience of being formally in the classroom and actually being assigned grades and having to interact. Um, and he, what he didn't share is he had to kind of earn his right to get into graduate school by taking some undergraduate courses to ensure he had the baseline knowledge. So he really did take the path 
um, and created a, a meaningful um, environment for all learners. So maybe he can share about his formal experience. The formal experience. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. As, as Ken mentioned, um, Education is, is a two-way street. You, it goes both ways. There's, uh, as an older adult in a class, especially about older adults, there's um, a, uh, the professor who may not be an older adult and only has, uh, has learned from, uh, from books may find um, some, some opportunities to get into warm discussions shall we say about uh, about what it's like to be uh, to get older but then again um i've learned an awful lot about how i'm supposed to be as an older adult in fact some people have ever come up to me and said don't you think it's time to act your age to which i respond i don't know i've not been this age before um i, I i'm i didn't really prepare to talk about the formal side of the education um, I enjoyed the whole thing. I, 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 it was challenging. Yes, it was very challenging. And learning how to use the computer. I mean, when I, when I just started this, when I started my education, there was one computer on campus. One computer, and we, we were using punch cards. Um, I don't think there's a student in the, uh, at UBCO who knows what a punch card is. Um, it's a process. You've got to learn. You've got to adapt to what's uh, what's coming at you, and it's there are so many benefits. And and I joked about getting to know well your grandchildren, but they're the ones who really do understand how to make the computers work. They rely on them. I I, I sorry, I'm I'm not answering your question, Jen, but I just didn't gear up to it. No, but you are. You're getting you're getting an experience of one of the challenges that you overcame and how you overcame it as a learner. And I think, um, from my recollection, it was also other students around you that were always able to offer assistance. So I think it is a spot on answer. And thank you for sharing that, Dale. There yeah. was a question of finances, and I know um, Gary also experienced this. Um, are there uh, costs associated with seniors to take courses or older adults? I believe that the cost remain the same for taking the courses, uh, regardless of age, um, unless that's changed. But I would ask, yeah, I would ask Jennifer if uh, if you're aware. <laughs> it, it has changed. There are, and it's a provincial, I believe, mandate unless a university has opted out. Um, but older adults, uh, beyond the ancillary fees, the actual course fees um, are up. Uh, I believe no charge. Still, uh, Gary can speak to this. Um, I didn't uh, encounter yeah. any expenses whatsoever while uh, while going to uh, uh, UBCO. Um, the admission fees associated with applying, covered by uh, the government, the uh, all all of the tuition fees covered. I didn't pay a cent. So I thank you uh, all for your contribution to my educational uh, uh, funds. Thank Even you. Being on this webinar, I'm learning things. See, it's co-learning, it's co-sharing. Um, there was a question in the chat about uh, some ways that current students can get involved um, and help UBCO in being an age-friendly university. So I'm gonna wonder if maybe, John, you can speak to ways that students can engage with communities um, or communities can engage with students um, either through a learning process or a research process. Yeah, um, Jen, actually, there's a, another question from Ellen that just came in as well, which, which actually aligns quite nicely with Kai's um, question as well. So, um, yes, I think that one of the real issues that we have in universities are entry points. It's, you know, this is sort of big, sort of impenetrable, you know, institution on the hill outside of town. And it's like, where the hell do I start, uh, you know, to, 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 to actually do something, get involved, meet people, meet the right faculty members, meet other students. And I think, you know, realistically, this is a challenge that we really still need to address. Um, and there's a number of ways that we can do it. Um, I would say 
to think about maybe um, approaching the community service learning group who are based out of the registrar's office. Work done by Robin Bunn there is excellent. Um, and what she does is she aligns the interests of undergraduate students primarily with community members so that they can actually explore potential projects together. Um, so Kai, your question, possibly could that be something where maybe you would approach Robin and say, hey, would it be interesting to maybe get a, a few students to actually produce a report, you know, about where there are opportunities, where there are challenges in regards to actually, you know, bringing, making the university more age friendly, but more specifically answering Ellen's question about what are the opportunities about how you would actually be, get involved, telephone numbers of people, emails of people, um, you know, and then start to see where interests might potentially align. I would also recommend that you reached out to Joanne Carey, who's the um, manager of the Institute for Community Engaged Research or the director, new director, Christine, Dr. Christine Schreier, um, and talk about the possibilities of research projects which are going on that you might want to be involved with or else bring your own research to the Institute and see whether there's interest actually within, um, you know, within existing faculty members. So there, I think there are two sort of like really significant um, you know, significant entry points. But I do think it's something that we need to work on. I think we need to maybe have a clearer web presence, you know, that allows people to, to actually approach the university with their research questions, with their desires, and for us to have some sort of directory which will point them in the right direction so that they could actually become more effectively involved with, with the research being going, uh, going on. Although it's not age-related, we have a number of programs which we're running across the summer which enable people with like lab intensive or, or sorry, with like, you know, with research that's lab intensive to actually bring in members of the community to actually work in their labs over the course of the summer. Although it was primarily focused on, on indigenous students, I would see that again, this is a program potentially that we might build out as well, because like I say, you know, like I said in my um, original presentation, you know, we need to create relevance for ourselves, and there's no better way to be able to create that relevance than to invite members of the community to come in and be a part of what we're doing here at the university. Thanks, John. Dale, Gary, anything you'd like to add? No? Okay. Uh, Sally actually commented in the chat box that another great way to engage and it's not that hard to get up the hill is the bus services to UBCO. It's a great way to connect with uh, younger people as well as faculty. I rode the bus this morning today from Vernon. So it was a, a great interaction to chat with people and, and uh, connect both with faculty, staff and students. So there's one way as well. Um, I do wanna I indicate uh, there was a comment about age length. So for those of you that are wondering, AgeLink uh, started as a student society here at UBC Okanagan, and it um, is a means for students and older adults to connect socially. Um, and it's especially been embraced by international students who really um, miss home. And they provide uh, different social engagements, whether it be board game night, their dance is always very popular, and I think their, their evening dance is coming up. Um, and then a great way to best understand um, different cultural holidays and share cultural holidays in a real family environment. So they do various activities um, that support social engagement. And that's, I think, the other thing that goes back to get, um, Dale's comment about extracurricular. It's about education, but it's also about social engagement, communicating, creating meaningful relationships across generations. And that's something that I think the age-friendly university embraces as a whole. So if you are interested in age-friendly university or the age link, the age link is in the um, chat box. Now we've got about two to three minutes here. So I'm gonna open it up to our panel for any last minute thoughts um, or things that you'd like to share as individuals consider about how to engage with the university and how the university can continue on its journey to become more age-friendly. John, lead us off. I'd, I'd love to pick up on something that Dale said earlier around sort of the, the, um, the university student sort of course unions. I think there's all sorts of potential for maybe older um, students and, and um, maybe people outside of the community to start to develop maybe their own course union as a way of actually sort of creating some sort of, you know, some sort of hub for them to be able to think about sharing resources, uh, think about sharing opportunities, 
Um, and I think as well, that gives you a much sort of firmer um, way to actually directly engage with not just other students, but also with faculty members as well. So I would definitely encourage um, people to think about, uh, about um, doing that. Thanks, John. Yeah? Yeah, I think one piece of advice I'd want to share, maybe based on my own experience, uh, I'm currently a PhD student at uh, Boise U of T as well. Uh, while uh, working as a professional, but I also have uh, a family and uh, four four young children. Um, so going back to school uh, with the family uh, can be quite challenging. Uh, I think managing your expectations and understanding that um, a traditional program uh, isn't necessarily like that timeline to completion isn't uh, isn't necessarily attainable and isn't the goal. Uh, it's about lifelong learning and, and about um, creating a the path to completion that uh, fits you. Um, so not uh, not trying to set expectations around uh, a timeline that is uh, going to set you up for for failure, but to be really kind to yourself around uh, the number of responsibilities that you may have in your life and uh, your education being just one of those responsibilities. That's not an excuse for not scheduling time and dedicating time, uh, whether that's waking up early each day uh, and putting just uh, a pen to paper on and getting one page done, or if it works best for you to, to wake up uh, on a Sunday morning and spend some of that time digging in deep uh, to get uh, to make some progress. But uh, at the same time, just uh, have some grace with uh, how much you may have on your plate and understand that uh, you are making progress Thank you, Dale, for sharing that. And good luck with the last little bits of your uh, dissertation as well. Gary, any closing thoughts? And before you say your closing thoughts, I will also say safe travels back today. And thank you for joining us from Toronto. Thank you very much. The uh, bicycle ride around Lake Ontario was a lot of fun. Anyways, um, yes, my the only thing I can uh, I can offer right now is if you're thinking about it, do it. Get in, get involved, and remember, you will be learning, but the people around you will also be learning from you. Thank you, Gary. And thank you, all three of you, as well as our attendees um, today for joining us and exploring what an age-friendly university looks like across the generations, from research to teaching to lived experiences. Um, I will remind you, as, as an attendee, you will get an evaluation form, and we do look forward to feedback, both on this event as well as other events that you would like us to host here at the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a beautiful day wherever you are. Bye now.